Hello, everybody. Welcome to season three of the Radical Candor podcast. I'm Kim Scott, author of Radical Candor and co-founder of Radical Candor, the company. And I'm Jason Rosoff, CEO and co-founder of Radical Candor. And I'm Amy Sandler, Radical Candor Chief Content Officer and your host for the Radical Candor podcast. Before we dive into today's topic, which is quiet versus loud listening, we wanted to update you on a few new things we've got going on. Starting February 16th, Jason and I are facilitating a new course called Radical Candor 101. This is a six-week laugh and learn workshop to help you acquire the feedback skills you need to practice radical candor like a boss, even if you aren't one. Also, if you haven't read the book. This introductory course uses our hilarious workplace comedy series, The Feedback Loop, that we co-created with Second City Works. It stars our own Kim Scott and In Living Colors' David Allen Greer and is designed to teach you the principles of radical candor in a way that's fun. Kim will even join the course in week six for a live Q&A. You'll also get access to a community of feedback friendlies so you can practice in between sessions. For those who can't join in person, we're also offering a view-only class pass. Learn more and sign up at radicalcandor.com slash feedback. It is hilarious, Jason, if we say so ourselves. (laughs) It's totally really fucking funny. (laughs) Can we say that? I don't know. I guess we are. And in addition to our new public course, our very own Kim Scott. She's got a new book coming out March 16th. Kim, tell us everything we need to know about your new book, Just Work. We're so excited. I am really excited too. So, so I wrote Just Work because early on in, as we were going and doing radical candor talks and workshops, I was doing a workshop at a Silicon Valley startup in which the CEO is a black woman, one of too few in tech. And she pulled me aside at the the end of the meeting and she said, Kim, you know, I really like radical candor. I think it's going to help our culture enormously. But I got to tell you, it's much harder for me to practice radical candor than it is for a lot of other people in this organization. Because as soon as I offer someone a little bit of criticism, if I seem even the tiniest bit annoyed, I get slimed with the angry black woman stereotype. And I knew this was true. I had known this woman for more than a decade. And I realized suddenly that although in that period of time, she had had plenty of things to be annoyed about, she had never seemed even the tiniest bit annoyed. And it really hit me hard, a couple of things. One, the toll that must have taken on her. And two, why was I not more conscious of what was happening for her sooner? So I realized that if we want to build the kind of radically candid work environments that we all long for, we really need to identify what are the things that get in the way. And so what Just Work tries to do is break down the problem of workplace injustice into its component parts so we can solve it. So it sort of differentiates between bias, prejudice, and bullying. So often, We want to pretend like something that is actually prejudice is bias because it seems easier to deal with in that case. So distinguishing between these three different attitudes and behaviors is important. And then it takes into account what happens when we layer power on top of bias, prejudice, and bullying. And most importantly, what are the things that we can do as leaders? What are the things that we can do as upstanders? What are the things we can do as people harmed? And what are the things we can do even as people who cause harm, which we all do and are bound to do from time to time in order to create more just working environments? So sorry, that's a a mouthful, but that's as quickly as I can say it, what the new book is about. It's so important. And I think one of the things people are really curious to hear about, it's such an important topic, will there be stories in this book, Kim? Because I know you like telling stories. You know, it's interesting. When I started writing this book, I thought, well, I'll have to interview a lot of people because I've never really suffered workplace injustice. And then when I started thinking about it, I, I thought, oh my gosh, I have been in denial my whole career about the kind of what I call gender BS that I've experienced, uh, the, the bias, the prejudice, the bullying, the discrimination, the harassment, the physical violations. I've had, uh, I've experienced all the, all of those things all too often. And a lot of early readers of the book have said the same thing. They've said, gosh, I never would have said before I read this book that I've been bullied at work. And now I have the words for what has happened to me. And that makes it much easier. As Kimberly Crenshaw said, if you can't name a problem, it's really hard to fix it. Well said. 
Now, here is my request of everybody. Please, 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 please buy the book. It really matters a lot, and pre-orders really matter a lot. I don't beg often, but I'm going to beg now. Please, 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 please buy the book. You can go to RadicalCandor.com and choose books from the link in the header and see where to buy it, or you can buy the book wherever you usually buy books. I would encourage everybody to patronize their local bookstore. All righty, Kim's begging you to buy books. We're also going to be talking about quiet and loud listening. So quiet listening can be done in a few different ways. And Kim, in Radical Candor, you talk about how one of your students in that Managing at Apple class, he said that he tried to make sure to spend at least 10 minutes in every one-on-one meeting listening silently without any kind of reaction. He wanted to keep his facial expression, his body language totally neutral. I feel like Some folks might perceive that as manipulative or unnatural in some way. So like, what do you think about this tactic? How how do you actually define quiet listening? So I think, I mean, definitely a lot of people found it a little creepy or unsettling when somebody is is not responding in any way. But I I thought what was so wise about what he did was he, he became very conscious that if you're really listening to someone and, and not interrupting them, there's more than one way to interrupt someone. You can interrupt them with your words, but you can also interrupt them with your facial expression, with your body language. And so managing to stay totally neutral for a little bit of time really encouraged people to say things they wouldn't otherwise say. We don't Mm -hmm. realize how we're encouraging people not to keep talking with just the facial expressions that we're making. So I really liked what he did, but but it is important to acknowledge we, we used to do this exercise where people would try to stay totally neutral, just talking to the person next to them. We'd break into groups of two. And a lot of people really liked it, and a lot of people really found it creepy. So I think it's important, just like radical canter gets measured, not at the speaker's mouth, but at the listener's ear, the benefit of this exercise <laughs> gets measured not at the blank person's face, but at how the other person is responding. I think that, especially in the age of virtual, there's a real risk that if you stay motionless and expressionless, that people be worried that the video feed has frozen and (laughs) you are no longer there. That's actually something that's come up quite a lot recently in workshops too, of just like the the weird idiosyncrasies of trying to communicate over video with the, the natural lag there. And I think that... For some people, they're so used to being interrupted. It's so common to be interrupted that when they're not, it can be interpreted as disinterest. That doesn't seem like you're actually paying attention. It seems like you don't care about what they're saying. And so I I love the, the, the point like driving home this idea, using this as an opportunity to remind us that radical candor measured at the other person's experience. And I think some, there are some gentle ways that you can encourage someone to keep talking without necessarily expressing your opinion or your feeling about what they're saying. In facilitation, and I've used this in one-on-ones, sometimes I'll just say, hey, can you tell me a little bit more about that? I'm curious to hear more. Just to to let the person know, like, I I am engaged and I actually do, uh, like, I'd love for you to continue sharing. And I think that can, that might be a, a neutral way without expressing a belief about what they're saying, a neutral way of encouraging them to keep going. Hey, yeah, Jason, so- can you tell me a little more about that? <laughs> Sorry. I, I couldn't couldn't resist. You couldn't resist. It's really interesting. When I was at Apple, some somebody else told me, made me aware of something. If you're talking to me, or if you were at that point in my career, I was very likely to say, "Yeah, yeah, 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 yeah." You know, I, and I thought I was being <laughs> encouraging. And this guy was like, "It sounds to me like you're telling me to hurry up and shut up." <laughs> and, and and that was not at all my intention. And so I was very grateful that he told me that I was having that impact on him because then I realized my husband pointed it out to me that I do it on the phone. And I realized, in fact, that was what I was saying. <laughs> Can you hurry up and <laughs> shut up? Because I don't like to not. I love my husband, but I don't like to talk on the phone. Yeah. 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 We do the mindful listening or focus listening exercise in our workshops, and it's very structured, you know, two or three minutes where people are talking. And I think one of the things is it's not that sort of stone cold, like neutral where there's, you're just, you know, as Jason said, are you frozen? There's smiling, there's nodding. So there's some sort of affirmation like, Kim, you're nodding. So that gives me, okay, she's, she's tracking what I'm saying in the, in the Zoom I'm video. I'm nodding and I'm having to use all my self-control. She's used to say, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm feeling very, very affirmed. 
And one of the best things about the listening exercise is that after we'll ask how that was. And this could be, for some people, it could be the longest two and a half minutes of their life. For some people, it could be very challenging because they felt like it was hard to not jump in, which is how they show affirmation. So what I heard this week on a, in a workshop, which was so helpful, was that for managers especially, they're so used to someone coming to them with problems that this attendee, and I hear this quite a bit, it was such a relief for them to be able to sit for two and a half minutes and to actually listen and to not feel like they had to solve the problem. And what she shared was that it was actually enabled her to show up even more present to what the person was saying rather than going right into problem solving mode. Now, I'm not saying that we never solve problems, but I'm just saying that if you have a couple of minutes of dedicated listening, you can actually go even deeper and see what's going on rather than your sort of cognitive reframing of like, what problem do I need to solve now. In the part of the book where we are talking about quiet listening and loud listening, part of it is not just about, not only about these one-on-one conversations where the content is maybe interpersonal, but there's also a, a theme in this part of the book about encouraging different ideas to be shared. And one of the things that I've noticed is in defense of neutrality is that even our positive reinforcement in a conversation it can be very leading because we're more likely to be positive when we agree with what the other person is saying. We're more likely to encourage someone to continue when we agree with what they're saying, which is just reinforcing the echo chamber, right? Like you're just hear- you're hearing exactly what you want. And so I think this idea of the exercise, what the exercise provides, uh, Amy, that you're just describing is intentionality. Mm-hmm. So it's not intention to be fully neutral, but is it is setting the intention to listen and process what the other person is saying, as opposed to decide how you feel about what the other person is saying. And that I think is really helpful in in helping us maintain a more open stance. In addition to the benefit the other person gets of our presence and attention, it also helps us be a little bit more open. I find a relief in saying, my job is really to hear what the other person is saying. That gives me a kind of focus that is often missing when I go into a conversation. So I think there's just a a tangible psychological benefit as a result. Do you feel like that's your definition of quiet listening then, Jason? I think for me, my definition of quiet listening is, is not interjecting my perspective or my opinion. Like, That is what's most important to me. When I am focused on quiet listening, I'm trying to make sure that I am not communicating my thought uh, about what, about the answer or solving the problem, however you want to describe it, that I am maintaining neutrality in terms of like my perspective as best I can. Again, it's really hard because can you control that someone says something that you thought the exact same, same thing yesterday and you smile a little bit? Uh, You know what I'm saying? Like it's really hard to control our body language at that level. But at the same time, that intention, uh, I think it helps me stay in that place and helps me stay focused on that that goal of quietly listening to what the other person is saying. Kim, you share in the book that quiet listening is not necessarily your natural (laughs) go-to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, it is not. No, it is not. I am definitely, by nature, a loud listener. But I really do want to understand what other people think. And I also... I'm acutely aware that I often have the worst ideas in the room. So the thing that has helped me, like, let's go back to the, the situation Jason was describing and, and his practice of, of quiet listening. It's, it's not to jump in and try to say what you think or solve the problem. And I think for me, when I'm in quiet listening mode, I'm really trying very hard not even to think of the solution to the problem. Mm -hmm. Because if if I think about it, then I'm going to say. So I really try to to just remain open to what the other person thinks and and to remain open to the fact that I may not understand the problem, that I think I understand the problem, but I may not understand the problem. So I think that is quite, for me, loud listening is when I have the thought, and I know I'm probably telegraphing the thought, even less can I control my facial expressions than my, than my verbal diarrhea. But I think that's making sure that I'm working hard to create an environment where people can really disagree with me and where, where it's fun to disagree with me, where it's not like this tedious, where people don't dread a disagreement with me. And so that's what I mean by loud listening. I'm going to say what I think, 
but I'm going to insist that you disagree with it and tell me why I'm wrong. And I'm going to get very excited when you're, when I'm wrong and sort of theatrical about being wrong. Is the theatricality related to maybe a power imbalance because you really want people to sort of counteract or give their opinion, even if you're the boss, like where does power fit into the loud listening equation? Loud listening is dangerous for a leader. It is, it's really, that's why a lot of people as they grow in their career and they become leaders are told to just shut up all the time. And what I have noticed is that it's almost impossible for those leaders to take that advice. <laughs> and so the question is, how, how can we use their communication style in a way that achieves the goal, which is participation. There's enormous research, and we've talked about this before, that shows when everyone on a team participates roughly equally, I mean, we don't have to measure every minute that everybody speaks, because I would do very badly on that measurement. But we want to make sure that everyone is participating in roughly an equal amount of time. And if the leader is too loud, they're going to become what I call the bloviating bullshitter. And I talk a lot about this in Just Work, but uh, and I think I mentioned it in Radical Candor as well. The bloviating BSer is the person who doesn't really know what they're talking about, but they're, they have kind of a dominant personality and they want, they wind up, even though they may not be bullies, they wind up bullying people in the room. And if you have positional authority, the odds that you become the bloviating BSer that prevents real dialogue and debate on your team are really high. And so what you want to do is you want to make sure if you do state your opinions and state them very strongly, that other people will state their counter opinions equally as strongly. Jason, state your counter opinion to the bloviating BS uh, description from Kim Scott, please. No, that is one place where I can't disagree with Kim, and I don't think it's unfortunate. I think that it's a really important idea because one of the things that I started to measure, especially in group conversations, is the amount of time where I felt like the conversation was producing new ideas or new content. And I wasn't like tracking minute by minute. I, I would start to notice that there are some people who have a tendency to talk for a long period of time and share a very small amount of information. And because they talked for a longer amount of time, it would often make it less obvious that someone who spoke for a very short amount of time but had something very insightful to say had actually shared something that was equally or more valuable to what they had shared. Like just the amount of time that someone talks gives credence to what they are saying. I think it's a really important idea, and I'm glad that you explored it even more in Just Work. I, I think the last, the last thing on my mind about loud listening was just that what you said at the beginning about how you set up loud listening, I think, is really, is really, really valuable. Something as simply a, as simple as I'm going to share my perspective, and I'll often even say, and I'm not a hundred percent sure that I agree with my perspective, but I'm putting it out there because I want to test it. I want to hear why you might agree or disagree with what I'm saying. I think setting those guardrails for people who maybe tend towards loud listening to, and you don't have to say what I said, you could say what Kim said, uh, I think is, is really, really helpful. Because otherwise, the tendency that I've seen is the person who speaks last and speaks loudest tends to, which is almost always the manager, <laughs> tends to uh, run away with, with the decision. Can I say a couple more things about power and loud listening? Yeah. Please. There's one benefit if you're if you're the manager of loud listening that's worth sort of thinking about, which is if you don't state your if you're the manager, if you're the or the whoever the leader in the group is and you don't state your opinion, other people are going to spend a lot of time guessing what your mm -hmm. waste a lot of time guessing what your opinion is. Or they might even like use your name in vain. There's always a period in a company's history where people will refer to the CEO by their first name and say, the CEO wants this, the CEO wants that. Well, mm -hmm. that's not true. Like the CEO doesn't necessarily want that, this or that. So I think that sort of the opinion clearly stated, but, but also equally as clearly state that I'm not sure this is right. And it's your all's job to push back on it. And, and it's our job collectively to have a debate that will get us to the right place. I mean, even Steve Jobs, who was not known for his shy retiring personality, he would often start a conversation with, this may be a dopey idea. Now, that's not how we think of him in general, but I think with, with some of the people who worked most closely with him, they understood that, I mean, it was not always a gentle thing. Somebody said, 
he's a lion and he's going to roar and he wants you to roar back, but don't roar back if you're not a lion. (laughs) So (laughs) it wasn't always a kind and gentle thing, but you really, you want to create the kind of environment where if you're going to roar, everyone around you expects to be able to roar back. And if they, if they're not comfortable, if those other people on your team are not loud listeners, you want to find a way to give the quiet ones a voice. That's your job as a leader, to make sure all the voices are heard. So as I think about our relationship and how much trust there is in a lot of the companies that we work with, where trust really comes up as a barrier to practicing radical candor, Jason, I'd I'd be really curious to know like, what happens if you and your manager do not have trust. If if you are a manager, how can you ensure that your listening style is going to work for this person? Um, How can you build the trust? When, when we talk about trust and communication, specifically with listening, I think the risk that I have seen manifest itself in low trust situations is that people are worried that you're, you're listening so intently to use what they say against them in some way, to punish them for, for sharing what is on their mind. So if you feel like there's low trust, I, I think one way out of that is to address, like, I recognize that I'm not doing a great job. As your leader, I'm not doing a great job of hearing all the the things that you're trying to tell me. And so I, in order to better do that, I'm going to try to change my approach to, to listening in this conversation. And maybe that's a quiet listening moment. Or maybe it's like, for me, it's on the other side. Like, sometimes people are wondering what I'm thinking. And as a result, they're worried about sharing what's on their mind. And so I'm going to say what I'm thinking so that it's out there for everybody to consider. And then I'm going to, I'm going to look forward to you sharing your perspective in return. I think we need to sort of like lay it out there that this is address the sort of elephant or <laughs> in the room, if there's low trust, we've got lions, we've got elephants, it's we've, a got, we've got a lot of animals in this episode. Without that, I, I think type of any tactic or, or tool that you pick up communication tool that you pick up, if it's a departure from your normal style, can come across as odd or manipulative. And so I think the easiest way out of it is just to call it what it is and say, I'm trying to address this issue. Here's how I'm, a, how I'm approaching it. We'll see if this is helpful. <laughs> if it's not helpful, we'll try something else. Yeah, I, th- I think one of the things that happened to me, I've talked about this before, early in my career, an HR business partner at Google came to me and said, Kim, you're intimidating your team. And, and I, that was not my image of myself. I do not see myself as an intimidating person. And I said, oh, no, nobody's intimidated. Little old me, nobody's intimidated by me. And so she said, well, just go ask your team to do something that's impossible and see if anybody pushes back. And so I went in and I asked for the impossible and nobody said no. And I realized that, indeed, I had shut them down. I had I had shut down reasonable conversation. And that was when I really realized I needed to be, I, I couldn't shut down myself. It wasn't going to help at that point for me to shut myself down. So I had, a, I had to work hard to open everybody else up and to earn their trust. And one of the ways, Jason and I have talked about this, one of the ways that I tried to do that then is to make my listening tangible. That was why I had the I was wrong, you were right statue that I used to go put around people's on people's desks because it was this big like glass thing that some customer had given us. And it was useful because it showed that I was excited to be proven wrong, that I was eager to be proven wrong and that nobody should be reluctant to disagree with me. All right. Well, now it's time for our Radical Candor Checklist, tips you can use to start putting Radical Candor into practice. Kim, I'm going to build off of what you just said for our first tip, which is that you need to make listening tangible. You talked about the I was wrong, you were right statue. So even having visible manifestations, in a way, it's actually another way to reward the candor, to sort of reward the act of the sharing of the feedback. So make your listening tangible. I would say tip number two is to be aware of your own style and don't try to fight your style. If you're a loud listener, you're probably not going to be a successful, quiet listener. You should try it once in a while, but it's not enough to make it safe for others to challenge you. You need to make it unsafe for them not to challenge you. You need to really encourage challenge. And last tip is that like everything else, listening is a skill and bringing some intention to the practice, whether it's loud listening or quiet listening, can make a huge difference. Even though it seems like you're doing another thing, 
Don't forget what Amy shared that often it's a relief just to give yourself permission to do one thing <laughs> for five minutes in a meeting can be a huge re- relief. So remember to practice your, your listening. Can I add tip number four? You always can. Tip number four is, and this, this one is especially for all you experienced managers out there. Don't solve the problem. Just listen. Adopt Jason's mantra. My job here is to listen, not to fix. Well, thank you all for practicing listening to the Radical Candor podcast. Thanks for joining us. Our podcast features Radical Candor co-founders Kim Scott and Jason Rosoff, is produced by our director of content, Brandy Neal, and hosted by me, Amy Sandler. Music is by Cliff Goldmacher. Go ahead and follow us on Twitter at Candor and find us online at RadicalCandor.com.